For May the 8th, 2020, we talk about XCOM Chimera Squad, the Final Fantasy VII remake, and we ask you about your most ridiculous or useless pieces of gaming hardware. Welcome to Level 328. My name is Cole Ross. I'm Dennis Furia. I'm David Meismith. And I'm Ben Merkel. And you're listening to The Level. It's a podcast for people who love video games. Uh, David, I need to apologize to you, and I also need to apologize to Jala. Uh, something about the way, we, the way we record and possibly about your microphone or your internet has made it so that the program that records us occasionally just pitch shifts both of your voices down lower. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so it happened once on your track, David, a few weeks ago, mm -hmm. and I was able to fix it. Um, however, <laughs> last episode, it happened for both you and Jala. Like the, the the file that I got back from the service that I use just kind of had that built in, and the backup track that I record had a bunch of clicks in it. So I you know just it was it was all staticky. So I couldn't fix it. So yeah, last episode had you guys, I think in the in the opening, I, I assured everybody that you were not going through ultra puberty. But <laughs> <laughs> so I I just I wanted to open open up with a open up with an apology occasionally all of your words dip down like this and then can't kind of came back up so I, apology i feel left out i demand to sound like james earl jones <laughs> <laughs> oh so yeah that's that's my story basically everything like the novelty is worn off of this like i am simultaneously just kind of done done with staying in but also like I'm actually kind of terrified at the idea of things opening up, like the idea of things going back to normal depresses me now. Mm -hmm. So I've got to work through that. Um, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> I I thought pretty much nothing has changed for you. Um, I don't. I don't know. Pretty. I mean, definitely among the four of us or the five of us, rather, things have changed the prob probably the least for me. Because like even though Jala works from home a lot, she still had to, you know, she still went into the office sometimes. But mm. like even still, there's a, just a certain amount of existential overhead. So it's not like bummed out that like <laughs> oh the blizzard's ending and we're gonna have to go back and make up a bunch of ground at school. It's more. I, I mean, okay, I'm not going to try and rationalize my weird anxiety and depression, but <laughs> that's about where we're at. I'm a, like it's it, I. <laughs> I think that maybe there's yeah. like a a certain amount of acclimation that's happened to the to the existential overhead or what, but yeah, that's that's that, that that's where I am. Yeah, I don't um, think it affects like any one person more than the other by based on how often they go outside. Like everyone's right. equally can't go outside right now. So. Right. Yeah, and everyone is still. I mean, like that. I was talking talking with some family about this, and I was like, yeah, you know. It's you, you remember like you know when your power goes out and then you walk into a room and you still just by reflex turn on a light switch. Mm -hmm. Yep, that that that, that happened. To, okay, good. I'm happy. Some of you said yep and didn't just leave yeah. me twisting. <laughs> that would have been <laughs> <Get 'em>. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's like that. Except you know, for for me, it's like oh yeah, I'll get into the bookstore and like browse around at stuff. Nope, can't do it. Store's not open. Yeah. Yeah, it's just a bunch of just like even still six or so weeks in the thought of the thought of my head is like, yeah, I could I could go run run to a place like even, you know, I'm sorry, I'm bloviating at this point. I will hand the floor over at one point. But like, even okay. though I do work from home, I do, you know, like solitude and all of that. I still every day, you know gave myself a reason to leave the house like to go get something or run an errand or go see family or whatever like and now i I can't problem. really i can't really do that I, I i gave myself reasons to leave the house yes <laughs> <laughs> why did you have hope before cole What's that about? <laughs> <laughs> oh man uh dennis you were not here last time so i'll throw it to you um yeah uh, what, what's going on uh, same old stuff. You were making me think of uh, Simon Sinek said something. Uh, he was talking to his company about where they go from here. Uh, and he's the noted um, uh, the golden circle thinker. He's like a 
whatever marketing dude. Yeah. Uh, but he talked about the importance of like from here, our focus needs to be on, you know, what do we become rather than reclaiming what we've been. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I found that helpful at least in, in, in my thinking about what life looks like. Uh, well, on a personal level, like at a family level, and then also just on a societal level is like, all right, the, the idea of reclaiming a normal is is kind of dead and there's there's grieving and sadness that happens with that but mm -hmm. like my my focus where i i hope uh we can get people's focus to is like how do we make whatever we get to next um better than what we had yeah so it's yeah normal normal is uh is not coming back um and even even once coronavirus is gone i think the the normal that we knew is is long gone it doesn't mm -hmm. have to be a bad thing yeah we can make it better I don't have a lot of hope uh, that we will, but we can. <laughs> oh no! I know I didn't. I didn't mean. I didn't mean to take the to, to take the air out of it. Oh uh, yeah, no, could, I was such I was such a bummer that I knocked Dennis offline. <laughs> yeah, and we couldn't ward off pessimism in the intro of the show. Nope. <laughs> I heard. I heard. I don't have. <laughs> Oh wait, one moment! I completely forgot to even start recording. Uh, here, oh hello. <laughs> no, it's fine. I I I got, I got it all. Uh, people are going to hear what happens when we turn on the recorder. Okay, okay, here we go. <laughs> you see what we have to deal with. <laughs> you see? Do you see what we have to deal with when Cole forgets everything? But what have you been up to besides besides trying to pierce the the yeah, veil? Yeah, of... trying to trying to stay positive. Um, yeah. I've done uh, backyard camping is the next great adventure with my kiddos. Mm -hmm. um, so we did it on Saturday night, which was great for like eighty percent of the night, and the last twenty percent decided to pour rain. So we had a little five a.m. scramble inside. That's part um, of camping. Yeah. It's, it's part of camping. Yeah, it was, it was the real deal experience, um, <laughs> and they were pretty happy about it. Um, you know, you always pay for something like that in just them being wiped out and crabby as hell the next night. Um, mm. but still worth, still worth. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, you, and I'm, I'm talking about, I'm talking about me and Jen as well as the kids. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, could be, could be because you slept, you slept on the ground outside when your bed was less than a hundred feet away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you do dumb things when you're in quarantine. Yeah. You know, uh, <laughs> uh, and, and, and for your kids. <laughs> yeah. They, it, it's so funny though. There was the moment of panic where like, um, you know, we, we, they were so excited, like, Oh, this is the best thing ever for, you know, for the entire night and, you know, hanging out outside. And then like five minutes before everyone settled down, I was like, wait, I want to go inside. I want to go inside. I want to go inside. Like, <laughs> Why I was, like, was he I freaking out? He just decided he wanted to go inside. And so okay. I was like, let me, I'll go get you a blankie from inside. And yeah. Like, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And brought him, brought him something from inside out and that, that calmed it. But gotcha. Uh, and he was way cooler about coming inside in the rain than he was about the, the whole blankie thing. So nice. <laughs> It was fun. The the random things that uh, that you learn, the quirks. No. Yeah. Did you guys just do sleeping bags on the ground, or did you have any air mattresses? Or oh pads no. Or we, so we have like the air mattress that ate Manhattan. It is a queen size air mattress where literally hmm. it's it's um think like a um a suitcase with rollers. Like it's a, it's a big luggage bag, uh -huh. um, but it's it is still the size of a maybe a small trunk. We'll say. Uh, roll that sucker out. You plug it in. Uh, we have a couple extensions cords leading out to the um, to the tent, which is a great part of backyard camping. Right. Uh, and literally, you flip a switch, and this thing unfolds transformer like as it <laughs> inflates, and it's got like supports and a box uh, under it and everything. Um, and so that's that's what we slept on. Which hmm. I think we, we it was actually a conversation in um, the parenting channel of Slack, which is the kids are all right. If anyone wants to <laughs> join that. Um, but, um, that, you know, your, your sleeping implements early on in camping determines so much of your impression of it. Mm -hmm. Cause someone was like, oh yeah, we just did literally like sleeping bag in the ground and I hate camping. Oh, and, oh. <laughs> that's not even like, that's like not even safe. I, I, I don't know yeah. what to yeah. say about that. Like, <laughs> Hashtag bad for you. Yeah. I mean, um, that. But that's how I camped when I was a kid. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, how do you really? feel about camping now? I like it. Yeah. But see, I, don't know. 
I came around. I I <laughs> no, like by myself now. I have like an air mattress and do yeah. glamping more than camping. But no, I, I, I uh, when when I was a kid, when, when you know when we did backyard camping, you know, did the exact same thing: pitch the tent under the tree and sleep on ex- sleep basically just on exposed <laughs> roots. <Yeah. laughs> I would be sure my back is fucked up. Yeah, oh, yeah. See, I wasn't thinking that. I was thinking more the uh, temperature, like. You want something to keep the earth from sucking all the uh, heat out of your body. Yeah, so there's that's, that. That's survived, and I and I've, <laughs> I I have been camping since then. I haven't, not, not for a little while, but like in high school and college, we used to go, used to go camping. Um, I am be- I'm a firm. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh no, no, we we used to go camping because we thought somehow we thought that um, oh gosh, like state parks would have fewer people trying to catch us drinking. Uh, which was which was a, a dumb a dumb idea, but <laughs> that's a that, that that has the sheriff who considers it his calling. Mm-hmm. Swinging by yeah. swinging by old Pleasant Hill, trying to bust up campsites. Yeah, we we've <sighs> become firm proponents of cabining. If we're going to go to state park, mm, yeah. like, uh, and and again, if, if that's available to you, yeah. feasible for you, it's a it's a good way to go. Yeah. Also, I, I that that want... costs a lot of money. <laughs> Campsites like mm. like twelve bucks a piece. <laughs> yep. See, I I just want America to adopt uh like steal uh was it right to roam or whatever from um uh from Europe. Britain. Yeah. Wait, is that Britain? Yeah, 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 yeah. What is that? You it's can ba- okay. go on. You you have a better definition than I do. So you should say. It. So it's it's basically any undeveloped land you more or less have a right to pass through and or camp on as long as you're not damaging it. Hmm. Ah, so that one guy that was like camping on Paradise Island of Disneyland or whatever it was. <laughs> and they caught if, that yeah. in, if that were in Britain, then yeah, that would be yeah. fair game. That's hilarious. Yeah. And I or think like it's-, it's, it's also relevant to like, for example, you can't keep people from like going to the beach. Yeah. Things like yeah. that. Mm. I think it's an Easter egg too. The law got passed because somebody was walking through like Madonna's like acreage or something. I don't know if this is apocryphal or not, but uh, <laughs> no, uh, no, because it's like it's yeah, the law, law, law right? originates from like several hundred years ago. Uh, okay, yeah. maybe it was challenged under that or something. I need to get my facts straight. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, um, well, that's cool. Backyard camping is fun. Uh, David, how about you? Um, not uh, not too much going on um i finally finished uh uzumaki so that was that was good stuff oh sweet what'd you think of the uh the back half of it um overall i like the back half of it i'm kind of uh eh about the actual ending everybody but Uh, me is eh about the actual ending (laughs) just it doesn't really resolve anything i'm fine with that (laughs) <laughs> welcome to yeah, life I, sucker i mean just it, it it is so for, first off junji ito does not know how to end anything and also <laughs> with how lovecraft inspired it is if it had a good ending it would actually be very it would not be a good <laughs> it would not be faithful oh to its inspirations mm. see but i feel like there's a difference between that and just not having an ending which is effectively what it is Oh, I mean, I, I would say it has an ending, but I don't know that we can get into details without spoiling it. Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, I, I think I think it's a so this is something that I, I really like reading. Uh, I'm a big fan of like the uh, SCP, um, you know, fiction online. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, that's, you know, kind of a big element of those is the kind of the idea that you know, you you aren't supposed to explain things, but that's not this. That's not exactly the same as like not having any. I don't know if you'd say closure or like like you have to have some sort of kind of indication of what it. You know, I guess I guess it's kind of the the most effective way to end something like that is to basically give the person enough information that they can kind of figure out what's going on, but not enough that they can 
completely figure out what's going on, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Or, and yeah, I, I feel like the it was strongly within the category of just not even like, you know, there being nothing, no indication of stuff going on. Mm -hmm. The closest but, you mean, can ever get on something like that is being able to say, eh, it wasn't effective for me. No. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, I mean, o overall, uh, you know, we re uh, really enjoyed it. You know, it felt like, it, um, you know, de definitely, definitely, even though I'd say the ending didn't have much payoff, I feel like the the stories kind of leading up to that had pretty good payoff. Mm -hmm. Also, um, the I completely forget the characters' names, but the the main character's boyfriend uh is <laughs> is just continues to be you know a hilarious just really well written character to the degree <laughs> that he's by which i mean to the most part he's not written yeah <laughs> he exists just like to 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 say things exactly as they are happening and everybody else gets to be blase around him and ignore him until it's too late <laughs> yeah yeah i just feel like there's uh, I'll ha I'll have to uh, figure out if there's some way. I'm I'm reading it on Kindle, so if there's mm -hmm. some way to like screen grab or something, there's a a a I don't know what you call it, a comic cell or whatever yeah. that I think is is just my my favorite from any comic I've ever read. Where it's just <laughs> you know there's one scene where it's kind of you know in between you know episodes of craziness and they're you know, having a, a date on the beach and he's just like sitting there and like clear, clearly has not slept in like weeks and, <laughs> you know, has not shaved or, you know, any of that. And it's like, has the thousand yard stare and she's like got, got her head on his, uh, his shoulder, like, you know, enjoying the romantic moment. <laughs> it's like, I, I just love the, the capturing the two characters in one <laughs> shot. Yeah, Shuichi and uh, Kira. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So, yeah, cool. I'm going. I'm going to definitely look into uh, some of his other stuff. I mm -hmm. think if I read just for being, um, just kind of, I don't know, non sequitur or whatever. He has published a whole bunch of horror manga. And then one manga about owning cats. Yeah, yeah. No, his uh, his his cat cat diary. Uh, Yan and Moo. Uh, it's great. Uh, it's it's one of my favorite comics actually. It's super good. Oh, okay. I, I read that even before I got Greta. No, it's like it. His illustration style works really well with it. Um, and it's super heartwarming. The 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 mm -hmm. way that he comes around to liking his wife's cats. It's uh, it's great. Nice. There's lots of like little like slice of life like trivia stuff because it, it is just literally about about him <laughs> about 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 him and his wife and their cats. So, uh, so I, I so, can't recommend it enough. Apropos of nothing, David, you made me think. Um, I was reading "Walking Your Octopus" to Milo and Luke <laughs> oh, the nice. other day. Yeah, they they brought it out of whatever room it was in, and we browsed through. So <laughs> on the adv on, on advice for pets comics. <laughs> nice. So this is. I don't know, semi-related, but I, I don't know if I, if you know, are there any, I don't know, wait, I guess kind of pop scholarly works on like Japanese horror? Because the, the one thing I feel like in reading this is, I guess I feel like I've been exposed to enough of it to be able to tell that there's definitely, mm -hmm. you know, kind of motifs and, you know, conventions and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. but not necessarily enough to be able to really understand and pick up on them. Hmm. I don't know of anything like that. The closest I've ever come is just, uh, you know, a couple of books about like different yokai, which I got okay. specifically for like, uh, you know, interest. Cause I love bestiaries, you know, and reference books, yeah. re reference books like that. And those have enough, enough folklore that, you know, certain Japanese, uh, you know, horror works, kind of draw from or assume that people will know but it is nowhere near as focused as uh, as, as what you might be asking for yeah, if there was the ever big... a place where tv tropes would shine and give surprising amounts of in, amounts of insight my bet would be on on that subject yeah that's, that's probably that that would be a good place to start actually 
Yeah, because what really got me thinking about it is, uh, you know, playing uh, World of Darkness, um, I guess a bunch of the, um, I don't know what you'd call them, acts, so myst- I guess they call them mysteries. A bunch of the mm-hmm. mysteries, I guess, are direct translations of, uh, <clears throat> like, Japanese um, urban legends. Mm-hmm. Huh. Yep. And so, like, I guess... My understanding is a couple of them are like much easier to solve if you actually know the legend they're they're <laughs> referencing. Yeah, no, I would like to see just a straight presentation of those as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very cool. Nice, uh, Ben. How about you? I'll uh, try and make a semi segue. Uh, I heard about a Lovecraft inspired thing that's coming out on HBO called Lovecraft Country, oh, which yeah. is apparently mm-hmm. based on a book. Uh, that looks sweet. I don't know. Um, outside of the horror trope of having a uh, a remade song to sound creepy, uh, <laughs> it looked really original and good. What so, song did they did they adapt for it or cover? Like, uh, old old like pop song where they say like one two three four, <laughs> and that's what they slow down yeah, and try and make like creepy. Anymore. Oh yeah, it's like from an Apple commercial or something. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a uh, what is it? Uh, not that, uh, sorry, not that one. It's an older one. It's like from the fifties. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that's a uh, Jordan Peele is doing that, right? This production company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, no, I've I've heard very good things about that book. I know uh, Gary read it um, at some point in the past. I'm excited is, about is that. Peele, the one who did uh, the Twilight Zone as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get out. I need to check that out. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. He's yeah, good. That's He's... Everything. <laughs> That he's directed or produced. He's he's a nut, kind, kind of a similar thing. I mean, he, he's someone that I'd be interested to read some sort of uh uh I I don't know like biography or something. Of like, where did he come from? In in terms of like, until recently, I knew he him as the dude that made like funny Keep... like uh you know sketch comedy stuff, and all <laughs> of a sudden he's making like he he did super, plenty. Super, he did plenty of interviews for Get Out when it came out that you can mm-hmm. look into where he talks about yeah. making the movie. Yeah. Okay, I'll have to track that down. Yeah, yeah. he's just super, super talented director who happens to like scary things. <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> yeah. Oh, but I mean, other other than that, do you have anything going on, Ben? Or is it just uh, <laughs> no. the, 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 indo- uh, the indoor life? It's coronavirus season, so yeah. it's, there's there's very <laughs> little to talk about. So. Yeah. It's weird uh, because, I mean, there's, like, not as many movies coming out or anything. Or if they do, nobody sees them, you know. And so it's, like, and, like, sports aren't around, which isn't really much a factor for me, but it's a factor for other people. So it's, like, all you got to go on is, like, TV or video games, kind of, you know. And it's just, like, it's it's weird the shift in talking about media. I guess that said, I did finish watching uh, Midnight Gospel last week. And that is, like... I, I like it a lot. So, like, thumbs up. Animation style is amazing. The interviews are hit or miss, maybe, with the episode, but uh, it ends very strongly in the eighth episode. So Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. That's the uh, the Penn Ward Adventure Time one you mentioned last time? Yeah. Penn, Pendleton Ward does the animation for it, and I didn't know this until after I watched it, but they basically take clips from a podcast that, uh, I forget his name, it's a comedian, uh, shoot, I, I forget his name, but he's a comedian who kind of does a bunch of, like, uh, hallucinogen type drugs and talks about his experiences. Okay, um, it's it's a nice pairing for the show. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Let me. Uh, huh. I I recognize the name Phil Hendry, but that is that is all I know that he's. I know he's like a voice actor. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Nice. Well, um, that's that, that that's some banter. I think that I'm ready to get into the actual show here. Not that this isn't part of the show. Um, and we're going to have a usual kind of show for you. We've got the grind, we've got the multiplayer, and we've got the end boss. And why don't we get started with the grind, the grind, where we talk about the games we have been playing over the past period of time or so. Uh, Dennis, since you were away last time, I will throw to you. Yeah, and I've I've got a huge one to talk about, at least huge for me. Okay. Um, in, in context of the series, it's kind of a little side thingus but we'll, we'll get to that um i have been playing xcom chimera squad oh, oh sweet. That dang looks yeah which is like the pseudo sequel a pseudo next game i mean it is the next game in the xcom franchise it's not like a full sequel it's like it is it is the blood dragon to xcom 2's far cry yeah uh, if i may and 
my god guys down is up up is down i don't i don't know what the hell is going on i think i like it but i just it is <laughs> the, the the best way i can figure out how to put it um and i actually i people agree that i posted this to reddit and um that's i think right now my best upvoted post so mm-hmm. that's nice um, but don't know how uh, to interpret that <laughs> so i think close to three thousand upvotes so that's nice okay um I don't know why I said that. Anyway, um, the uh, the the analogy I would make is: imagine you came home one day, and someone had completely rearranged your bedroom. Okay. And nothing's where you expected. Everything feels kind of off, and you feel kind of violated. But at the same time, some of the changes are kind of creative and nice. Like yeah. that is XCOM Chimera Squad. <laughs> so you I mean like so you had been following the series basically, you know, from XCOM Enemy Unknown. You loved XCOM too. I remember you having really mm-hmm. huge things to say, really, really, really great things to say about War of the Chosen specifically. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. So you've got more invested in this, I think, than any than anybody here. I, I went back and looked. I think I have upwards of 600 hours across games in the series. It gets yeah. a little dicey because I played a significant amount of the first one on PS3. Right. So I wasn't keeping track yeah. of hours. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that is, I mean, easily XCOM 2 is easily my favorite game of all time and, and all this stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, I recently I recently went back to that actually um, before... Uh, almost in preparation for chimera squad Mm -hmm. um but anyway so chimera squad the the big biggest change the most obvious change is that rather than turn order taking place as your entire squad goes then their entire squad goes um it is now on a one-on-one basis so one of your characters goes uh, and then in all likelihood, one of their character goes, characters goes. So it's not tied specifically to like um, an initiative kind of thing or like a like a speed stat? Uh, that would be – no, it's not tied to a stat. But at the beginning of every um, encounter, um, you do a breach, which is basically a, a free turn for you. Um, and you cho- choose the order that your agents move in that turn. Okay. And then that sets their order in the initiative for the rest of the round. Yeah. And so probably the easiest way to say is now now it acts like normal initiative okay. for you know most reference points that people would have rather than the kind of XCOM that I know mm-hmm. of the entirety of one turn goes mm-hmm. or one side goes and then the other. So it's not like mm-hmm. Final Fantasy Tactics where like you have a knight and you have a thief and the knight has a speed, you know, has like an initiative of, you know, a 50 and the Mm-mm. and the thief has one of 25 and so basically it counts down every you know every tick and then the ap is you know there for the thief twice as much as as it is for the for the knight okay right no yeah. it's it, basically at the beginning of each encounter you set one two three four here's here's the order i want you going through the gotcha. door and then for the rest of the round unless you use abilities to change it um that's the order that when when you know when your turn pops up that's the agent that will be available gotcha. five six seven eight you do not deviate from- <laughs> <laughs> oh dude they have deviated um because like i said that's that's the most apparent change the second second biggest is the the breaching that i just mentioned where you kind of kick things off with a bang um uh, sometimes literally going through a wall if you have a breaching charge um and there will be multiple entrance points um and based on the entrance point there might be benefits or downsides so one entrance point might have low visibility so your your agents are harder to hit as they're going through yeah. or another entrance point might be you know heavily surveyed where there's likely to be more er- enemies around that area um and you get one turn um uh, where each of your agents goes in a row um, to take out as many people as you can in the room. Um, and you'll be able to see if, you know, you, you breach in um, and enemies will be either surprised, alert, or aggressive. Mm-hmm. Um, and you have to prioritize your targets, one, on just how powerful and dangerous the enemy is overall, but then also whether they are aggressive or alert or surprised. Because if mm-hmm. they um, they get kind of a breach turn as well if they're alert or aggressive. Uh, if they're alert, they'll kind of run for cover or buff or, or you know, do something like that. If they're aggressive, they're going to attack. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there might be smaller enemies that normally you would ignore on the breach, but because they're aggressive, you you kind of are obligated to take them out or eat the damage. Yeah. Um, that is the third thing that is very, very different about the game. Like it just, everything is very, very different and I don't know what to think of it, but it's kind of fun. Um, in, in XCOM and XCOM 2, uh, you might as well not have health on your soldiers. 
um, because taking damage in a mission is is kind of a either a death sentence or an irrelevance sentence. Um, your your soldier will be out for a pretty punishing number of days. They'll have to miss several missions. Um, and by the time they're available again, they're probably behind on the XP curve and just like underpowered versus what you need. And so the entire focus as you're, as you're kind of strategizing in XCOM and XCOM 2 is like, I need to not take damage in the first place. Because mm-hmm. while my soldier might not die, it's going to effectively take them out of the picture. Mm-hmm. Um, in Chimera Squad, uh, you, as long as you do not completely get knocked out, um, you, you will be perfectly fine for the next mission. And so suddenly you're using health like a resource like you would in other games in a way that you haven't in, mm-hmm. in the past uh entries in the series okay uh man where to go from there it, it, you know xcom is famous for like your soldiers these uh, soldiers are these randomly generated peons that you're going to lose a lot of now each is a bespoke character that has a personality and they've got banter back and forth with each other um versus having a save the world um you know fight back against an alien invasion aesthetic you are a police force mm-hmm. in a city that is like the first city after the alien invasion is over where the leftover aliens and humans and hybrids are living together. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's uh, alien 90210. Okay. Um, And it's got that level of campiness that I, you know, I made the analogy to blood dragon, but there's, there's an extra layer of camp on top of all this, just with the banter and the, the kind of personality of the game. Yeah. Um, That it's, it's, it's definitely lighter and a little more cheesy than the, the previous XCOMs. I mean, specifically XCOM 2, which is bleak as fuck. So holy crap, there's a lot difference. And I'm not even touching on half of it, but this, (laughs) this game guys. Um, so, I think I've, so I've main, with, mainlined like 13, 15 hours of it <laughs> um, in, in just the past week. Um, absolutely. Like the, you know, even though all that is different, that XCOM tactics feel is still there, um, which I really appreciate. What were you going to say, David? So you, you mentioned uh, hybrid. So what we're saying is that XCOM Rule 34 is now canon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Specifically, uh, XCOM Snake Rule 34. Um, <laughs> the, the Vipers in XCOM 2 were all decidedly female. Yeah. And uh, caused, caused no, quite, uh, no shortage of a stir in the community. So <laughs> I'll, let, I'll let everyone Google that on their own. I'd rather not. <laughs> 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 uh, but specifically in in um, XCOM two, a lot of the plot is that um, the the alien occupying force started mixing uh, human and uh, DNA of the subjugated aliens mm-hmm. uh, that they had brought to the planet into these kind of you know to make their own army, and and that's where the hybrids come. Is like okay, well you know in XCOM two you win, you beat the bad guys, um, and the really the elders the main villains of all of this were oppressing the aliens they were using as their invading force as much mm-hmm. as they were oppressing humans um and so now like they're gone yet all these aliens are stuck here what do you do yeah and um so the you know the idea is that one well, there's a bunch of hybrids from this genetic modding so it doesn't have to be rule 34 unless you want it to be mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> and then city city 31 um, which is the the city that uh, Chimera Squad takes place in? Is this uh, is this kind of example or the experiment to prove that um, all, all these different kind of uh, races, sects, etc., whatever species can can uh, make a life together? Yeah. So, can you, with your team being able to include aliens, can you get what are what are the guys that are basically the the xenomorphs? Are those the chrysalids or something? Yeah. Uh, let's see. I haven't seen any chrysalids on our team. I don't think they are because those are, are kind of like feral beasts. They're like typical gray man uh, aliens. You you have the sectoids you have on your team. Um, you have the mutons, which, uh, and sorry for anyone that's not familiar with big these boys. guys. But it's like, yeah, the big hulking <laughs> uh, muscle dudes. cyborgs, right? Uh, I don't think they're cyborgs. No, no, you're th- um, you're thinking of the of the hoppers or whatever they are. The the mutons are the big football looking dudes who, when they show up yeah. on a mission, they get rowdy and beat their chest and crack open some brewskis. Exactly, um, and and surprise. So they all they all wear masks when they're bad guys. They look super dopey when they don't have masks on <laughs> because they act, they ask, and look, they act and look dopey anyway. 
it's like oh you're my cousin brock yeah uh, <laughs> um so so yeah you've got them and then there's there's a viper uh so far i only have um the the sectoid and then one of the hybrids on my team hmm. um, um so yeah. i guess i guess my question you know so in basic xcom or at least xcom one and its expansion you have you know people who are recruited and they have a random class assigned to them for different classes and multiple opportunities to pick different kind of traits for them enemy within gave you the ability to customize them further into being mechs or into being um hybrids you know mm -hmm. you know with a cast of you know individual people with their own personalities and stuff I assume with their own backgrounds and their own kind of competencies, like how does the class situation work out and how does like character progression end up shaking out? Yeah, it is it, the classes or, or the individuals I should say are clearly inspired by the main classes. Mm -hmm. um, particularly they, they take inspiration from the roster roster of four basic classes and then three special classes that was in war of the chosen. Okay. Um, but whereas each of each of those um, in, in XCOM 2 kind of had two different trees, one that focused on on uh, or uh, one tree each for for two different concepts, mm -hmm. like the Rangers could focus on stealth or they could focus on their blades, uh, that sort of thing. Um, these classes seem to kind of put you in one of those lanes um, and have have more of a dedicated bent with with some small variances within that. They're mm -hmm. they're. Um, their tech trees or their skill trees are not nearly as broad as they were previously. Um, so by way of example, I have, I have two of the specialists on my team or what, what I associate with the specialist class, uh, which is the class that has like the gremlin robots that follow them around. Um, they do like hacky kind of um, and healy stuff. Um, but one of them is very clearly in kind of the, the medic uh, and support uh, kind of uh, ethos or concept the other is very clearly in the hacking and um kind of uh, android uh fighting concept okay so they, there's you know i you can recognize like oh that was inspired by this but they each individual feels like its own thing versus variants of um of a class they kind of specialize in in the um ideas that were there before okay the, I mean, I guess the other thing to say is the size of the maps is is way, way, way shrunk. Okay. Like in in general, a map I would say is about like sixteen by sixteen. Mm, wow, and that you, is. You can, you so... know, yeah, you can you can basically cross it with with a full turn if you want. Um, and in XCOM, especially at higher difficulties, where everything is about controlling vision and. Um, kind of playing at the edges of of your range to have everyone just kind of stuffed in a box together was suffocating at first <laughs> like it just and again this is before i made the connection i was like oh okay it's not as bad if my people take damage um i was just like this this is like this is terrible i'm screwed like <laughs> it is it is especially with the new turn order it's so much more binary it is it is this soldier's turn now you have to do something with them mm -hmm. it will be this bad guy's turn next and there's nothing you can do about that unless you kill that bad guy mm -hmm. that feels so incredibly at, at first it felt so incredibly restrictive mm -hmm. and binary it's like okay i i have to take that guy out and i either can or i can't um and then just you know i'm, I'm gonna take damage and mm -hmm. that that was you know, in, in XCOM, the previous games, it was so much about kind of a, a cascading if then yeah. where it's like, OK, I, I can move any one of my guys. If I can put damage on this first guy, then I can press that advantage with my other characters. If I miss my first shot, mm -hmm. um, I can move this way to cover or I can shift focus to this other weaker enemy. Uh, and it's kind of within your turn, you're able to play it out as you, um, you know, see what happens. Mm -hmm. And that's that's not really there in the same way in, in Chimera Squad. Um, what does or what, what does start happening, or what I did find really intriguing, is well, yeah, you you are locked into the turn order by and large. There there are rarely there there are characters with skills that can pull yeah, someone forward. Abilities in turn. that'll yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but your your mentality uh, starts being how can I get someone to take two? Mm -hmm. And it's like how do I how do I get ahead in the back and forth? 
And so can I can I stun one character and put damage on another with one turn so that next turn I can take out two. Mm -hmm. Then that puts me ahead. And, and there's the same sense of like, okay, there's a I can either press a rolling advantage or try to recover from from a missed shot. Um, but it's now you are you are going to take damage or kind of have return file fire in between those. Mm -hmm. So it's it's just it's such an interesting twist on on the series. Um, and are in, there in any ways? Oh, go ahead. Are there any bad guys that one shot people though? Eventually, or that's a that's a good question. I haven't come across it yet, okay. and I, I think I've played about a third of the game. Okay, um, cool. or a third of the main mission. Uh, what I will say is, I I try. I was like, you know, uh, there's there's the four difficulty levels, um, and I was like, you know, I'll start on the third. I, that's so that's I've done that Iron Man and XCOM two. I'm really familiar with this franchise. I can probably start there, and got my ass handed to me twice. <laughs> <laughs> so I bumped myself back down to the second, yeah. um, and have been playing through on that. So uh, on harder difficulties, I absolutely believe um, you could be in danger of losing a person. Um, Are you playing you know, in, in one hit? Couple? That said, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I haven't played far enough, but um, it is it is a punishing game still. Um, and I've, I've gotten through plenty of missions just by the skin of my teeth. Are you playing it on PC or console? I'm playing it on PC. And I actually hadn't even checked if this is available on console. I don't know. Uh, it took so, a while to get XCOM 2 on, on uh, anything yeah. but PC. So. And hey, a fun fact, XCOM 2 is one of the games that I upgraded uh, my PC for. Ooh, so that is, uh, this is, I, I thankfully can still play this one. <laughs> Squad. Nice. Um, let's see. Looks. Yeah. I think it's just on PC for right now. Yeah. It just came out too. Like, so I could see them wanting to focus yeah. on it, but this is, I mean, it's a really good way for, to do a sequel, especially when you've got a successful sequel in the books, mm -hmm. you want to change up the formula, but you don't want to alienate fans. It's like that classic problem mm -hmm. of, of the sequel. Um, and this kind of offshoot, um, you know, side canon uh, story um, that's bite sized. They pr priced it appropriately for that, but plays with some really cool new ideas is, mm -hmm. is just a, a great way to go about it because they can fold in what worked into XCOM 3, mm -hmm. um, which I assume is coming and um, and, you know, kind of get a little more aggressively out there on changing up the formula without making people feel like there's an entire development cycle that's been wasted on on getting too far away. So. Um, yeah, it's, it's like, it is, if I'm not playing it, I'm thinking about it right now. So <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a good place that, that, like that, that sounds like you're describing XCOM to me. Yes. So. <laughs> yes. It is. That is, that is probably the most ringing endorsement I can give it. Um, as a quick aside, I also, well, I'll stop any, any other questions on Chimera squad. Well, it sounds good. <laughs> yeah. Well, what's the penalty for if, you know, if a character dies in a mission? Um, that is a great question. So I've had them get, um, you know, incapacitated, and but it's pretty easy to stabilize them. Um, they will get a scar. Okay. Um, and and that is some kind of debuff that you need to put them into therapy, essentially, to fix. So mm -hmm. they might lose mobility or they might have their, you know, zero chance to crit are, are just some of the ones that I've seen. Okay. Um, that happens frequently. Um I have never had someone like bleed all the way out. It is possible to once they're incapacitated to have them bleed out and die. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that's just a straight up failure or if there's some other, you know, they they are gone from the game. Yeah, uh, I was um, just curious if they did, if they did like a you know fire emblem permadeath kind of thing. Yeah, I'm I'm guessing they will just because it's XCOM and they're punishing like that, mm -hmm. and the roster of characters is larger than you will use in any one playthrough. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's, uh, I, hopefully I won't have to experience that for a good while, but hopefully I'll, I'll let you know when I find out. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, I, I, I also, like I mentioned, I, I went back and I played XCOM two dropped a bunch of, they called it the legacy hub and it was a bunch of free content. Um, and so I played through that in like preparation for Chimera squad. I had actually started it before I knew about Chimera squad and then was like, Oh, perfect. Like I'll, I'll finish this first one before I start chimera squad when i found out about it um and it's just a bunch of story side missions that kind of fill in a little bit of the lead up to the main game hmm. um which is fun just to have on on uh you know free stuff is always nice i appreciate that um but i just because i was playing through for fun i i set it to um uh just the normal difficulty level 
And I'm, I'm regretting that because it taught me all sorts of bad habits just yeah. getting through it that I have to unlearn <laughs> the next time I try to step up. Lapses in um, vigilance. Yes. And there are just a whole bunch of moments where it's like, okay, if, if this was on impossible or if this was on whatever, um, I would be dead right now. I need to not do that in the future. And then I find myself doing it again just because it's like, but I can right now. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but those are good and they let up. I, I really appreciate the entirety of those missions led up to one big dad joke. <laughs> like it is, I, they zagged on me yeah. when I expected them to zig. Um, <laughs> well, I, I don't know. I don't know if I should spoil it. I don't know if anyone cares um, since the plot is not the hugest part of XCOM. Um, but yeah, I, I will say it, it prominently features apparel. Okay. <laughs> I, uh, I don't know. I don't know how overt to be. It's been out for a while. Yeah. The um, you, you go on like a big dangerous quest to rescue this special piece of um equipment, um, and at the end of it, it is the combat turtleneck that the commander famously wears. Oh Jesus! <laughs> that's, that's right. It's just yeah. It's just it's just a turtleneck. Yeah. No. That's... <laughs> oh, ta- it's a it's a, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a it's a tactile ne- ta- tactile neck. T- tactical <laughs> yeah, tactical neck. Tactical turtleneck. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, the the tactical turtleneck. Um Archer has a great bit about the combat turtleneck. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I, I knew I was wandering into that neighborhood when I when, when, when I broke out the tactical turtle turtleneck, but <laughs> Yes. Um yeah, so lots and lots of XCOM. Um I, I think I played more hand of Gilgamech with the kids. Nothing new to say there. I'm I'm almost done with it. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's that's been me. Lots and lots of XCOM. But cool. it's the game almost over. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes, the game. I think I'm on the last mission. Right. Given that the, that chapter is titled Hand of Gilgamech, which is the name of the game. Yeah. I, f- I feel like that kind of has to be the end, right? Yeah. yeah maybe. <laughs> I mean, isn't Uncharted Among Thieves? Isn't Among Thieves like midway through the game? Oh, yeah. This mm. And this game is clearly as good as a Naughty Dog game. <laughs> <laughs> Oh goodness! Oh, nice. Um, yeah, I'm happy that one of us ta- uh, p- played and could talk about Camara Squad because I've been unable to touch that for busyness reasons. And I mean, if it's making someone who likes this series like you happy, uh, it will for busyness reasons, not business reasons. I mean, because one in the same. Is there a difference? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. There, 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 there really isn't. Um, who has something new? Does anybody have anything new? Um, I have uh, a little bit of something new. Okay. Um, so Steam start, uh, you know, occasionally will do free weekends for games. Okay. Uh, or now I think they might even be up to free weeks, but that's neither here nor there. So uh, from that, I uh, picked up Generation Zero, uh, hmm. which is oh. a... Yeah, so it's a open world kind of, uh, I guess it would be considered a survival game, although I don't think you ever have to like eat or drink or anything like that. So it's very light on the survival setting. Uh, oh, survival features, but it definitely has that feeling in terms of, you know, really emphasizing, you know, scrounging for ammo, stuff like that. Mm hmm. So it takes place in uh, 1980s Sweden. And uh, I guess the plot is that, you know, Sweden after uh, World War II, where it, you know, remained neutral, uh, basically resolves that, you know, it's a national disgrace that they didn't, you know, stand up to the Nazis and, you know, help the war effort. So they... um, basically institute a policy to you know kind of never again uh you know not be able to take care of themselves and so every um you know swedish citizen is you know trained in you know basic military skills and you know that sort of thing okay and then um inexplicably uh robots invade okay um (laughs) and like it, it basically like your character and his friends are off, um, you know, sa- sailing some boat, um, you know, off the coast of Sweden because presumably that is like what all Swedish people do in their uh, <laughs> uh, spare time. Okay. And when it gets you know attacked and you're the only survivor, 
and you basically it's... you know kind of wash up on shore. Okay, and that's pretty much the uh, the game so far. Um, you know. Honestly, I eventually gave up on it. it. You know, it seems like it's kind of got some interesting things going on with it. But the big problem that I had with it is it seems like the enemies don't really have... As far as I can tell, the enemies don't have a ability for you to, like, exit combat with them once you start it. Oh, so there's no way so to, like, to retreat. Right. So, like, I'll, you know, you'll go sprinting across the map and you'll be way outside of where they can see you and they'll somehow, like, hone in on you. Like, mm. I've, I've had instances where I'd, like, sit in cover for, like, five minutes. Okay. And, you know, they'd eventually find their way over to wherever I was. Huh. So... Is that it, just the trying to keep things interesting or yeah maybe i mean the problem is it just it doesn't work um Hmm. like with the game they're making um you know there's no regenerating health healing items are fairly ineffective and uh you know limited so you know a healing item you have about 100 hp and a healing item heals uh, about 25. Ooh. And in most fights, I would take, depending on the fight, between 25 and 50 uh, points of damage. So it's and a you thing. You can't where, use them out of combat? It's, oh, you can use them out of con- combat, but the problem is just, you know, that it's, it's not sustainable without doing a hit and run strategy. The game doesn't seem particularly viable. Mm. And uh, the system they have for the AI doesn't allow you to do hit and run. Mm. So honestly, the game feels like a um, early access game. Like if this was early access game, it'd probably be a pretty good early access game. Uh but it is not, so I guess hopefully eventually they'll you know, get it together. Okay. All games are it's... early access now. <laughs> yeah, it is out actually out. So I wanted to make sure what's in early <laughs> yeah. access. Yeah. So so, um, I mean, so I guess my question is, you know, like what's the what's the format of this game? Like, is there a is there a campaign that you're doing, or is it like Day Z where you're on a server? And it's you and other people um, trying to survive as long as you can. Well, that's one of the uh, little bit of both. Um, It's multiplayer, but I think only cooperative. And to be fair with everything I just said, it a little bit comes across like maybe this is a game where like multiplayer is not intended to be optional. Okay. Um, But there is a, there is a, Oh, uh, campaign all and you know even side missions but so far it's pretty much just been go here mm. hmm. so huh. go here plus plot reasoning or literally just well, like go I'm, here i mean it's basically like you know you'll you know go to a place and uh you know, say like early on, you go go to the church, you know, because that seems to be where survivors are heading. And, you know, you find evidence of the survivors, but there's a note that says like, hey, we had to abandon this area, you know, meet us at the farm west of here. So then you go to the farm west of there. So it's yeah. like, yes, there kind of is, but it all kind of boils down to go to place. Yeah. Hmm. That doesn't sound great, man. Yeah, you know, it's one of those things where it has a kind of a unique look and premise and stuff like that. It just, at least right now, um, you know, doesn't really do anything with it. Right. So that's kind of unfortunate. Uh, probably more, um, you know, kind of better is I've been continuing to play uh, Fallout 76. 
Okay. Um, let's see here. I've now um, introduced both factions. So the very first thing you kind of have to do uh, with the new expansion is go and convince both of the factions to oh uh, to let you inoculate them against the uh, scorch plague. Okay. Uh, so that you know the zombies don't just retake over Appalachia. Okay. And um, on the for the settlers, I basically went out to one of their forward posts to um, you know talk to one of the their doctor to get him to vouch for whether the stuff I was saying about inoculation was nonsense. <laughs> uh, because apparently only anti-vaxxers survived the apocalypse. Um, yeah, their heads are thin. And... Their skulls are thick enough that they can probably survive lots of concussions. Yeah, you know, mm-hmm. that that seems plausible. Um, so that was kind of more conventional. For the uh, raiders, I had to, basically my uh, inexplicably uh, drug-loving robot um, raider <laughs> friend, basically had me go out to find recordings of the former raider leader that is dead and so that she could you know pick out you know individual words and make a message making it look like he was still alive in order (laughs) to broadcast and like get the raiders to send out representatives it's like it's like a puzzle in gabriel knight (laughs) 2 And then uh, once once the the leader of the new raider faction uh, showed up, I basically was able to use enough big science words uh, to get them to just agree that I probably knew what I was talking about. <laughs> Rig and bra- the trans- razzle dazzle. <laughs> yeah, which basically translated to like having um, an extremely high intelligence score. Okay, <laughs> but. Um, so so that was kind of fun. And um, so I've been then kind of playing through, uh, you know, building up a faction uh, with the two camps, which is sort of the, the new end game grind. Okay. Uh, so overall, that's that's been fun. Uh, I am very, very often, though, reminded of just the fact that this is a game that does not understand that th- this is basically the game that is the ideal game for you if you played the um, previous Fallout games and felt like they would be great if they were just a little bit more grimdark all the time. Hmm. Sounds like a Bethesda thing. Yeah, but not really a Fallout thing. Right. Like... <laughs> I know. I I yesterday I was playing. I had a random encounter where you find a uh you know little girl uh you know standing in front of the grave of her dead cat that was just killed by a mole rat uh-huh. and crying about how it was her only friend and uh there's mm. like a toy toy alien on top if you you loot it. She says, "No, don't take you know Lucy's toy," and just and then that's it. Huh? It's like it's like no. There there has to be some you know. There's there's no like. I don't know. I feel like in order to be Fallout, like having that you know pathos, that's great. But then the other half of the Fallout equation is when you go on a quest to like get her a new pet. And she ends up somehow with like a pet death claw or something. Yeah, yeah. Like or they, they, the <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like they, they have not at all gotten the feel, feeling of that. So like, or like, you know, doing the, uh, you know, my robot friends. Um, quest line you know one of the robot or one of the robot factions one of the raider factions is basically uh sets themselves up they're like the diehards and they call themselves and like you know they dress 
you know, very, very like stereotypically Mad Max, you know, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And basically their entire thing is that they act like crazy raiders so that they won't have to actually kill anyone. <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> um, I'll bark no bite. Yeah. Right. And then and then when when like the zombie apocalypse happens and like people are desperate enough that they don't really, you know, are willing to take that risk, mm-hmm. the leader of the faction basically decides they're not going to uh uh you know sacrifice their humanity, so instead they just overdose themselves on chems. It's like Oh that's whoa. that's just that's just depressing. Like that's yeah. not not anything. That just sucks. Yeah, you took a Fallout setup and then you gave it a, a conclusion from a different series. The road. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's back you know, to the source material. Why do you do that? Oh. Yeah. So I mean, it's it's really there. There are definitely a number of things where it's like, what the heck are you doing here? Um, yeah. On the plus side, a lot of that stuff, um, may, maybe all of it that I've actually been talking about, I think was pre like Wastelanders setup. So the um, you know kind of the new material seems like it's much more kind of fun loving and silly. Right, right. Well, I mean, at least that shows that they're moving in the right direction, even even if there is legacy bummer stuff. Right. Exactly. Mm, yeah. Exactly. So. Um, and, and I do like that um, the they at least make the uh, new Raider faction somewhat sympathetic mm-hmm. in that, you know, they're not just, you know, a bunch of, you know, psychopaths. Mm-hmm. Not just so, a bunch yeah, of cannibals so, in S&M gear. Right, exactly. Yeah. Which, again, one of the factions, straight up cannibals. It's like, eh. A mm, little bit of nuance there. Yeah. Yeah. But, um. Yeah, uh, I I think actually my my two favorite things with that faction is um, I so sentry bots. If you if you haven't played the game a lot, sentry bots are a basically a robot equivalent of like a tank. They're one of one of the most uh, most dangerous enemies in the game. They have like dual hand uh, dual chain guns. On, arms and generally speaking when you uh kill them basically a mini nuke goes off oh Mm. uh so they're super powerful however one of the uh oh one of the new like settler kind of groups factions has a oh has a sentry bot called bessie that uh, doesn't have its hand cans anymore and apparently thinks that it is a cow. Okay. And it's, you know, paint, painted with, like, cow spots all over it. <laughs> okay. And so, and, and you know, their voice it, is just this very deep, uh, you know, kind of robotized voice. So mm-hmm. it's running around, you know, moo, <laughs> moo. That's like voices good. from last week's podcast. <laughs> yes, exactly. Oh. Um, sim- similarly, the all of the vendors in the settler faction are this uh, series of robots named Sunny. Uh, they're all named Sunny, and they all uh, insist that they are the only real Sunny, and that the the other Sunny bots are not to be trusted. <laughs> And you know, you you can go and you you can either tell them you know you are the best Sunny or like Kitchen Sunny is the best Sunny or whatever <laughs> and just just weird stuff like that. So yeah. you know they're definitely bringing back some of that. Yeah, that's good. So yeah, so that's all I've really got. Uh, any questions? No, I, I I don't I don't know that I have any questions. You have you run into run into anybody? Or are you not playing it online? Uh, I it's online only, so um, occasionally run into people. Um, haven't had a particularly um, you know noteworthy um, things. You know, every so often I'll get into a higher level group event, 
And those have generally, at least for me, been pre pretty positive experiences. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, people generally working together and, you know, you know, just seem to have a good approach to it. So that's nice because, you know, sometimes those sorts of things can get kind of nasty. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. Nice. Um, is that all you had? Generation Zero, Fallout 76? Cool. Um, I ben, I will go to you now. I got a medium one and a small one. Okay. Uh, small one is I played Rocket League over the weekend. Ooh. Uh, they're that doing is this shocking. Thing. Yeah. Well, actually, I mean, I've stopped playing it. It's not a game I play every week anymore. Um, <laughs> but I played it this week. Uh, and they have this thing where they're adding modes just for the weekend that you can play oh. that are pretty fun. And then that's it. They'll be gone after that. And so you have a very like limited opportunity to play them. So they had one a couple weeks ago that I missed where it was basically like the ball was like a magnet attracted to the goal. And so it was like this weird system where you didn't really have to be as precise with hitting the ball towards the goal. And uh, conversely, like you had to be much more defensive about like being able to knock the ball away since it was like more likely to be able to be directed towards the goal. Um, and it was apparently fun. I didn't play it, uh, but apparently it's going to come back and make another appearance sometime this month or for, uh, during the weekend. Cool. But the one that I played this weekend uh, was one where they combined two modes. There's a mode called Drop Shot. I don't know if you remember me talking about it since it was years ago when yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah. No, I, this is where the floor falls out, right? Yes. Uh, yeah. So when the ball hits the floor, it'll highlight a hex. The ball has like three states that it can be in, and that determines like how many hexes it highlights. Okay. Um, and then, uh, so it might be like one, it might be a ring around one, or it might be two rings around a single hex or whatever. So it gets mm -hmm. pretty big if you if it gets to the third state. The state that it's in depends on like basically how many times people have hit it since it's hit the ground. Okay. So like the longer it goes, the more, the higher volatility it is. Um, anyway, they combine this with this mode that they have called Rumble, which is a mode that they added like two years ago or so, where it's like you have these power-ups every 10 seconds that just do like random things like one is like your car has spikes on it so if you hit the ball it gets attached onto your car and then you can in the regular game just go make beeline for the goal and try and take it in um yeah. <laughs> there's like a, a plunger that'll drag the ball behind you and like pull it towards you um there's a bunch of things like this in the rumble mode and so they added that to drop shot and it was a very bizarre and even though they had both those mechanics existed before is a very unique experience like bringing them together um so it's just cool to kind of have new like a new vocabulary of how to play and like new strategies um so i only played that for a little bit but that was a lot of fun um so i don't know what rocket league's doing anymore it's like <laughs> the game's been out for like four or five years but they're still developing it it's yeah. like okay sure maybe i don't know um I guess there people who still play it who are really good and like the meta is even developed too. There's like this move where if you uh turn around in midair and like I don't know, you like hit it with the back of your car or something like that. Um like that does something different. And then there's huh. like another thing that people are doing where if they land their car on the ball in midair, they get an extra jump. And so people are abusing that where they're like hitting the ball in the air, landing on it, then jumping and continuing to juggling it and then landing on it again and stuff like that. That so, that speaks to an ability to control in this game that is unfathomable to me. Right. Like yeah. that no yeah. one no one can do I can barely like be in the same half. People can do things on purpose. <laughs> yeah. yeah. This isn't the game for that. Yeah. So yeah, I thankfully I don't get matched up with those people. So I guess the downside is I don't get to see it, but on the plus side, I don't get to see it. So, um, yeah. Uh, okay. But yeah, so that's fun. And apparently there's going to be new content as the month progresses every weekend. So that'll nice. be cool to see where that goes. Yeah. Um, the other thing I've been playing is I've continued to play Luigi's Mansion. I'm on the penthouse floor, so I'm almost done with the game, presumably, unless they do like a... Uh, was it Castle of not Castle of Burgundy? What is it? The vampire game where they turn the house upside down. I, I, I do really, like I really like Castle of Burgundy. <laughs> it's a board game. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, no, it's Castlevania. Uh, yeah, yeah, Castlevania yeah. Symphony of the Night, where you think you're at the end, and then there's a whole other castle that's upside down to go to. Yeah, so yeah. unless they do any shenanigans like that, I think I'm mm -hmm. at the end of the game. Um, it overall, it's a fine game. It's a uh, it is the Luigi to Mario, where it's not as good of a game as Mario Odyssey for mm -hmm. sure, but it's 
still like has a lot of really creative moments in it. So there's yeah. different like, parts that are good. Mm -hmm. um, if you're a kid, like 100% buy this game for your kid if your kid wants to play it. You know what I mean? Because it's like there's not really a downside there and they don't really have good quality control. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, but it, I mean, it, it, overall, it's like I guess it's it's I'm, I'm I don't regret playing it. I will put it that way. I don't have a bitter taste in my mouth as I do other games like maybe Assassin's Creed Odyssey towards the end of it. But uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I it's still creative. Every floor is like something completely different. Um, so it seems like it would have been a lot of fun to develop as a game. Mm -hmm. um, and each floor is, like, really well executed. There's a few that are actually aren't that good. The 14th floor, for example, was just, like, a single boss fight that was very underwhelming and took, yeah. like, maybe five minutes to end. Mm -hmm. But, you know, so some of them are hit or miss. But anyway, um, yeah, that's about all I got. So now, nice. <laughs> now I need new games to play. So yeah. I, I got a new game which I'll talk about next week when I've actually played it since I haven't played it yet. Mm -hmm. And then I'll probably play XCOM because that sounds really good. It does. It's uh, it's some fun stuff. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Yeah. I'm I'm happy you're enjoying Louis, Luigi's Mansion three. Yeah. Is, no. Wait, is it three? I thought it was just yeah. nope, it's you're Luigi's Mansion three. <laughs> yeah, one one came out on GameCube. Uh there was a three DS game called Dark of the Moon, and then this one is Luigi's Mansion Three. I'm sick of these like celebrity millionaires with all these mansions. <laughs> it's not even like it's he doesn't even own it. It's just a hotel that he goes to. <laughs> nice so that all you had man yep cool um all that i have is um i've played a few more hours of the final fantasy 7 remake i am continuing to have a good time um things opened up a little bit for me uh since i last spoke because i kind of got out of the uh, initial kind of like mission you know like intro stuff uh and mm -hmm. it like sets you loose to do like side quests in the slums of uh sector seven which is real neat, actually. It kind of reminds me a little bit of uh, of Yakuza, and I cannot remember if I, if that is a comparison that I came up with on my own or if I saw that on Twitter. Uh, but if I saw it on Twitter, I definitely can't remember who I who I saw it from. So <laughs> we're just gonna have we'll to give you half credit. we're just yeah. gonna have to live with that. No, but it's like you know, like you, the 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 story takes place in chapters, and you have like the main quest that you can choose to follow. But like, uh, you know, a lot of the side stuff you can do is like there are shopkeepers and citizens around the town who are like looking for help, and you're trying to build up Cloud's uh, reputation as a mercenary. So you're doing but, like some like regular kind of stuff, like oh, we need to go clear these drakes out of this, uh, out of this, you know, um, factory where people go and and and, and scavenge, right? Or there's like oh, <laughs> this little girl lost her three her three favorite cats, so you need to go find them. And there's funny yeah, stuff like that you do to get them back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's a little bit like that, but like the 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 small stakes of it make it feel very much like a yakuza kind of thing. Especially huh. because, like, you are in this kind of crowded and teeming area. Um, and I got to say, it's, like, real cool to get to see a little bit more of, like, th th basically what life is like in Midgar compared to the very little bit that you got just kind of in the sparsely populated version of it that you saw on the PlayStation. Um, Wait, I thought I thought generally your, your, you know, actions in the first game were, you know, making it so that there's not life on Midgar. <laughs> That's an accident. It's an accident. Um, <laughs> um, but, but you know, you're, you're doing the same thing too. The, you know, but uh, it wasn't your intention to blow. All you wanted to do was deactivate the reactor, not blow it up. Um, <laughs> you're, you're, you're a, you're a terrorist, but not a terrorist. Um <laughs> <laughs> something else that's kind of cool and I, I know some people have kind of like bucked back at, uh, against this as like hey maybe this wasn't something we necessarily really wanted um but um kind of getting to know your um the people who are part of your for lack of a better word terrorist cell like the other avalanche people who like yeah. were incidental characters and they had names and some personalities in the main game but you spend so little time uh do you know uh, so you spend so little time with them in the original here though they're like they're voice acted and like the uh uh the the, the big guy uh wedge uh he, his voice actor is the uh the actor who played badger on breaking bad which is really funny 
(laughs) because he's just he just sounds like badger from breaking bad um (laughs) but no like they're 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 fun like the characters are generally fun and there's like you know good emotional moments between like you and tifa and you know everything kind of benefits from being more cinematic you know i just uh like i'm I'm a mark for this i i am happy to be kind of along for the ride and all of this would be moot if the combat wasn't good and if the mechanics weren't good but like i'm still really enjoying the uh the the, the pressure and stagger system and they've you know opened up more kind of customization like they bring the materia system back um has everybody here played final fantasy 7 uh, yeah. no How not all the way through not have the materia system isn't that kind of the whole game no, no, they do. Like the, the, the they have the, oh, the okay. yeah they they okay. have they have the materia system, uh, which is which is good. To quick 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 version in the in the original, your character didn't really have. They basically had starting stats, um, but y- you had these special gems that you slotted into your weapons and armor that both gave you abilities and also changed your stats and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and the materia leveled up as you gained um, special experience. Um, and you could kind of like transfer stuff around in between people in addition to the experience that you had uh, just by fighting stuff. They bring that back here, but they also have weapon customization stuff uh, that you can do, uh, which is like little individual um, stat boosts that you can select for uh, for different weapons. In addition to the fact that most of the weapons have a special skill that you can learn, kind of like Final Fantasy IX um, a little bit. Uh, as you use that weapon, you <laughs> basically learn it. Um, and you can keep it around even if you don't have that equipped. Um, and, um, oh gosh, what else, what else am I thinking of? I don't know. It's just good. So here's, here's my question is, you know, let's say you had to make a choice between getting this, the remake, or just a completely new final fantasy, which do you think you would go with? I'm good with this one. Um, I don't know. (laughs) Like you feel like they, they do enough new within it that, uh, yeah, you know, it, it scratches that itch. Which is the better remake so far, this game or Resident Evil 3? I don't or know. Resident Evil 2. Resident, Resident Evil 2. Yeah, Resident Evil 2 is the best of all of them, I think, in terms okay. of in terms of doing, you know, both new things and also really honoring the feel of the mm-hmm. uh, of, of, of the original. Uh, mm-hmm. This is such a it is such a conversion that it's actually really hard to like compare them like you're hitting a lot of the same story beats but like the way you you, the way that you interact with this and kind of the scope of the story is both it's like it's 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 way more zoomed in but there's so much more detail you know yeah um you know so like this is good and satisfying like they 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 both expanded it (laughs) they expanded it mechanically but restricted it like in the scope of the story like i'm kind of kind of worried slash bummed out i mean i'm gonna get to the end of this and then it'll be another seven years before we get part two or whatever it is but we'll cross Mm -hmm. that bridge when we get there um wait and have they announced that or is this your speculation that there's going to be a part two no there's going to be a part two this only goes through the end of the the end of midgar which is like halfway through disc one um wow uh, yeah so and like they like they they've said yeah this you know the part part two is basically in planning right now so who knows what that means but um hmm. yeah so I I don't know where I would rank this against like RE three because like Resident Evil three is almost like an expansion for RE two where it is still really fun to play but it's not like necessarily a very faithful adaptation of three the original three Nemesis. Yeah. Th- this is more though a pre-expansion for the rest of final fantasy 7 remake though, right i mean kind of <laughs> uh, it's, it's the first installment <laughs> i'm just wondering about the the kids who how confused they must be when someone says like you know this is only halfway through uh disc one because you know not only do they not have any frame of reference of like what happened on the original uh, Final Fantasy VII discs, mm-hmm. but they also are unaware that at one point people bought games on discs. Yeah, and that they're the like what it mu- what it meant to switch between them. Yeah, you know, like even if you go and get like a digital copy of Final Fantasy VII now, like if you buy it on PSN, I think there's like a digital disc swapping that needs to happen. But like if you buy just like the regular remaster that came out you know, for Steam and, you know, Switch and stuff like that. I mean, 
it's like, like it's literally just one big thing you know there there is no disc break i mean see the gag in metal gear solid 4 where otacon comes in and tells you hey you need to switch the disc oh wait this is a blu-ray never mind <laughs> <laughs> yeah um any other questions about final fantasy 7 the remake i'm not glad you're enjoying it yeah it's good multiplayer now it is time for the multiplayer where we ask you a question and then you answer it dennis what's the question that you ask the nice people yeah and this is not so much me as a suggestion from omg a moose so thank you dude yeah thank you um, and and their idea was to ask what is the most impractical thing that you've owned for gaming and what motivated you to keep it around um, so i like the broadness of this could be a peripheral could be um you know hardware could be anything yeah, get it, getting in before somebody says my Wii U. Uh, the Wii U is yeah. a good system. That's a, <laughs> I didn't look and see if anybody said that, so uh, we'll find <laughs> out. Came, came up I, I thought of the joke, but I didn't think of the punchline. Wii U is probably the most fitting punchline for that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll get us started here with Patrick, who says, "I bought a Virtual Boy on clearance from KB Toys." It was something like $30, and I only kept it because it was a weird Nintendo artifact to own. Shit, man, I'd, I'd like to own a Virtual Boy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's good. Uh, let's has, see has here. Has everyone actually played one of them? Or What's is that? that rare? I said, has everyone actually played a Virtual Boy at one point? Or is, is that rare? I have not. My uh, have my not. my cousins had one, so I got to play it. Um, got to play like the uh, the tennis game, like the Mario tennis game on it, and then like some kind of it was like a descent clone. Yeah. 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 I the, I have the weirdest memory of being at, of all things, a dog training competition. <laughs> My dad trained like hunting dogs. And so you'd do competitions for that. Um, and just in the back of a pickup truck, some kid being like, hey, you want to check this out? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and that, that was when I got to try the virtual boy. It, 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 man, even then I knew it was like, hey, this, can't, this probably can't be good for my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> this is probably terrible. Yeah. Uh, let's see, David, what does OMG a moose say? So, uh, Omega moose says might as well share mine for this. When I went off to college, I built gaming PC that would do everything, which ended up meaning a full tower case made of rolled steel. Oof. It weighed over 30 pounds and was over three feet tall. Do everything or could... survive everything. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if he wants to be able to crawl into it in case there's some kind of nuclear blast. <laughs> yeah. That seems that's seeming more and more like a uh, smart move. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. uh, I thought I could add stuff to it later and make it do everything I ever needed since it had so much space. In reality, I never did. <laughs> it was a huge pain to move and of like the 85 uh, quarter inch bays, only one of them ever got anything in it. <laughs> Since then, every PC I've owned has had a small case made of aluminum. Probably wise. Man, like, so it, if I had ever seen a full tower case before I, b b b before, you know, back at the studio where I worked, they ordered a rendering machine. I, 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 I didn't remember it. Like when you see one of those, it's like, it looks like a filing cabinet. It's, it, 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 it's like a, it's like a prop from some kind of movie. They're really, no, really big. How, how does this compare to like a, like circa year 2000, like conventional PC? Is so I don't know what we're talking about. Or? I mean, so I, I don't know what the um I, I like I, I don't know when the standard like the, the the case standard sizes came in, but like you know my Windows PC right here that is about the same size as most PCs I've had since you know around that time um, is like a half ATX. So like picture something that is about twice as tall as like a regular ass. Um, a, a, a just a, just like a regular PC case that you're thinking of. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's oh. a lot. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Ben, what does Dulce say? Dulce says, I had the DK bongos for the GameCube, and I think I forgot about them until my controllers died. I used these bongos <laughs> as controllers for at least six <laughs> months. They were super uncomfortable, but I was a broke kid who couldn't afford new controllers, but wanted to keep playing games. Hey. And then 
a DKC no evil. <laughs> That's some Wimbledon. impressive dedication. Yeah. No, I mean, like, just, uh, and if you keep him around, you can do little stunt runs on Dark Souls with him. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Dennis, what does Austin say? Austin says, I once paid 40 bucks for a soft DDR dance pad that you had to body slam just to make it work. Also, not something I bought, but was a gift, was a set of SNES controllers that let you change the setting of, of the movement Oh, the, change the setting on the movement and button presses, and they seem to only change to worse or unplayable. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a controller That's you can make funny. not work with the press of a button. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ollie writes, I have a chainsaw controller for my GameCube. <laughs> It came with uh, it came with Resident Evil Four, and it, it is atrocious to use uh, to actually play games with. But it's cool, and so I used it as my second controller for a long time, and would <laughs> would use it when playing games against friends when I would lose at almost everything. Uh, Mario Power Tennis was particularly awkward with it, but you're just giving yourself a handicap, like you like you have an excuse built in. I say I'd like to see you do better while holding a. <sighs> holding a chainsaw and then they offer and be like, no it's my favorite controller <laughs> yeah <laughs> no it's my favorite excuse i mean controller <laughs> I, I, I love that chainsaw controller it is it is uh it is a monument to an elegance it's amazing um <laughs> similarly the uh the slime controller that came with uh that came with dragon quest 8 i think it was uh, or I think, man, there was some game, it might have been Onimusha, but I, I could be forgetting one of the Onimusha games that came with a PS2 controller that was like in the, uh, um, in, in the handle of a katana. That's <laughs> oh, just awesome. Yeah. Wait, wait, you said that, I, I remember something for like, was it Wii? Something like that? Maybe not. I mean, there were definitely like inserts you could get, like you could put, you know, like a, like a sword that you could put your, uh, Wii remote into. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> let's see here, David. What does Greg say? Oh, sorry, I was busy searching for Katana controller. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I got my Xbox. I mean, all Katanas are kind of a controller, just for you know, life and death. <laughs> it's just one yeah. button mm-hmm. kill. <laughs> <laughs> um, Greg says, when I got my Xbox 360 new, I realized that I might need a second controller for when a friend came around. And not wanting to spend top dollar on another controller, I miss the days when systems came with two. I picked up a used third-party controller for cheap at the same GameStop where I bought the system at. It was truly awful. <laughs> Don't recall who made it. Uh, the answer is Mad Cats. Uh, it looked like the cheap uh, bastard child of a joystick with the regular controller. Mm. Felt cheap and flimsy and was very uncomfortable in your hands. The few times I did play head to head against someone in my apartment, I always used the junk controller myself because I felt so bad at how terrible it was. Yeah. <laughs> love that yeah i i'm like 90 percent certain it was mad cats i mean that was the that was definitely the joke brand you know back back in the day like oh man i forget the name like the brand name of it the only thing that was actually like worse there was a line of controllers that had fans built inside of them so that it would like cool your palm so you didn't get sweaty or whatever um but the thing is the actual controller like the button components and stuff were not very good additionally because this thing was circulating air um, and, you know, I, I know this because people traded them in when i worked at the GameStop. none of them didn't smell like just pure uncut ass oh, um, no. no just like it just the, the <laughs> with collected... fans to spread it around too yeah yeah you know i mean just anything that was traded in had a little bit of a uh, let's call it a patina um you know like especially like the like the used system room you know just it just it was full of game cubes that reeked of chinese food and bong water but these controllers have that plus hand funk and sweat funk in it oh no <laughs> uh let's see here ben what does martinus say Martinus says, every piece of garbage plastic instrument I have bought to fuel my guitar hero slash rock band addiction. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, I had to spend way too much on complete sets so we could play as a full band. <laughs> These days, my Xbox 360 Guitar Hero 2 guitar sees any uh, sees any use, uh, and the rest 
is junk or the rest of the junk is gathering dust in the attic. Hey, mm-hmm. that's on you because you're not playing the games anymore. It's not on the games or the <laughs> instruments themselves. Don't make this about them. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, this is basically my answer. And Dennis, I I uh, feel personally attacked by you posting the, uh, <laughs> the, the Mustang controller. Um, down there. Yes. but I'll address that later on. Um, <laughs> um, Dennis, we have the first co-host kicked off the show, <laughs> <laughs> banned forever. It was a good eleven <laughs> years, Dennis. <laughs> who, who knew the Mustang was the weak spot? <laughs> um, Dennis, what does Lindsay say before your execution? Yeah. yeah, Lindsay says the rocket launcher that came with Super Scope Six was designed to be impossible for an eight-year-old to use. I remember using it more as a toy than a game. My brother found it a few years ago and kept it. He still has it in his dorm in college as a joke. Nice. I need to. I need to look up what this is. Is this like a, one of those old handheld games or what? No, Super Scope was like the. Um, so you know how the NES had the zapper. A little pistol mm-hmm, thing. Mm-hmm. The super scope was like a longer, like rifle shaped rifle rocket launcher kind of thing. Oh, um, hey. yeah, it's actually kind of neat. The one that's in Smash Bros. Yes, I think there are both. I think that there there is a zapper that uh, that Rob uses, but there is a super scope in uh, Smash Brothers. Nice. Yeah. Um, also, happy birthday, huh. Lindsay. Jala popped oh, hey, into yeah. the comments to say hey, happy, happy birthday. birthday. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Callum says, I have ended up with two full sets of Guitar Hero band instruments. As we still occasionally play those games, I keep them in a ca- I keep them in case anything breaks. Yeah, because, man, fuck trying to get replacements now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and then, then especially, let's... especially replacements that don't smell like ass. Yeah, yeah. I mean, at least at the very least, like all of the um, you, you can you can you can clean one of those things. It's all hard plastic, with the exception of the drum pads, and even those don't tend to absorb a lot of stink on them. <laughs> yeah. Um. Uh, let's see here, David. Round us out with what Robert says. Robert says, "Flight stick, used maybe twice, and so have for some reason." <laughs> Great death <dust> collector. <laughs> yeah. Uh, nobody has uh, nobody has said uh, still battalion set because if you have one of those, you uh, love your life and everything about it because you have a steel <laughs> battalion set and it rules. <laughs> yeah, I mean, my answer is, I mean, this would imply that I, that I regret having it, but definitely the most awkward stuff is all of my rock bands, uh, pair of paraphernalia. But like, I don't know, it's not been that huge of a deal to like move it from closet to closet. And pull it out like right now. A lot of it is sitting in uh, waterproof plastic, plastic containers at my garage, just up on shelves in case I decide to pull it out. With the exception of one guitar that is just inside, if I get the uh, if I get a hankering for it. Um, but yeah, gotta have the, that emergency ripcord gu- guitar. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes you just want to play. I don't know. <laughs> Sometimes you just want to play Guitar Hero or uh, Rock Band. They're fun games. Uh, but yeah, like the Mustang is definitely one that like I liked. So the the Mustang is uh, like the pro guitar controller that is not the actual guitar with like the MIDI uh, re- reader on it. It is mm-hmm. literally like a hundred and forty four button. Um, there's something like that. It was like forty four buttons or one hundred and forty four buttons. Um, uh, guitar where you have a button for each fret on each string, so you can like finger chords and things like that. And you have six strings to, uh, to, uh, to, to strum and pluck. Uh, it was real fun. Um, it would be a terrible way to learn guitar, but I had a good time with it. Um, I definitely have not used it very much since, you know, 2012 or so, let's say. Yeah. Just because an object sticks around doesn't mean that you have to keep using it. Like you probably got your worth out of that time and time again. Yeah. Yeah. And you you know, I'm looking over at my, real guitars that i can pull out and play now too so and i can play it because you know i can play it you know whenever i want because i'm in a house i'm not in an apartment (laughs) where i was before you know so Hmm. yeah um that's mine uh david how about you yeah so mine's gonna be just a little bit different in that it's going to be about what um crazy accessory i don't own Okay. Um, so, 
Gro <laughs> uh, growing up, my first video game uh, system I ever got is I got a used um, oh, NES with a whole bunch of games. Uh, and definitely some really great ones. Uh, you know, probably the most lasting impact being uh, the original Dragon Warrior. Yeah. Or Dragon Quest. Um, however, um, one of the games was uh, Gyromite. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, shit. Pro <laughs> problem being that I did not have a Rob, which is the weird oh, robot. No. <laughs> yeah, J Jeremy, um, like like he he puts little tops on the buttons and that changes the stage. Right. And one of the most enraging things about it that I actually didn't realize the actual cause until literally like 5 minutes ago where I pulled up the article is apparently the way this system actually worked is that you like put an NES controller, you know, in the, the Rob setup or whatever, and, you know, control the robot with the other controller. Mm -hmm. And that would cause the robot to like manipulate the uh, spinning top so that it pressed um, buttons on the second NES controller. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason that's relevant is there were a couple of times in which I got the, um, game to like work and do stuff but i could never figure out how you know like <laughs> it would work one time and then i'd try it again and apparently it was because you had to actually control the game via the second controller mm, yeah so is it just so a... yeah it's, yeah at some point i just happened to like pick up the wrong controller and the game worked or whatever <laughs> So, yes, yeah, so that was the weirdest accessory that I don't own. Um, I'm not sure of any weird ones I do own. Um, mm -hmm. Probably the one with fondest memories would be uh, Bokatai with its built-in light thingy. Hmm. Yeah, no, the, 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 so the solar sensor. Yeah. Nice. Also, weirdest uh, stealth game I've ever played. <laughs> that was uh, that was Hideo mm -hmm. Kojima. Yep. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. Um, ben, how about you? I don't really have much uh, video game peripherals. The only one I ever had was I got I think Rock Band Four, maybe the one that had a keyboard with it. Yeah, Rock Band Three. Yeah. All right, and so that, and I guess I had a controller at one point, but I don't know where that one either. So. Mm. Huh. those things but i guess they're not here so they're not really taking up room so i don't know yeah no that controller was also useful like you could take a midi cord and like use that as a use that as a, yeah. like an actual like keyboard but i also have a keyboard okay true all right <laughs> <laughs> uh dennis how about you yeah so mine is guitar hero related but not in the way you think um i you know my my main Guitar Hero days were Guitar Hero 3 back in college on an old-ass CRTV um, that weighed 6 billion pounds. Yeah, yeah. Um, and playing on literally anything else uh, just did not feel right. And because so that of the TV, lag, yeah. Because of the lag. Yeah, even, even though you can adjust for it, mm -hmm. I could just never get it out of my head um, that it might be off. And so that TV has followed us from house to house. <sighs> Um, and is in our basement now. Uh -huh. um, just, just because I probably haven't used it in multiple years. Mm -hmm. um, but if I ever do want to play, that is that is the place to go play on. Yeah. No, CRT, CRTs are hard are hard to get a hold of now. Mm -hmm. I've been on the lookout for ones just out on, out on curbs, uh, curbs here, but like I can never get to them when people throw them out um, before it rains. There was a really yeah. good console CRT that I wanted to get. It's like a big old cabinet. Like now, keep it in the. I'll keep it in a corner and like set a record player player on top of it or something just to make it a tower to obsolescence. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but no dice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, gotta move quick, man. Yep. Um, cool. Well, thanks everybody uh, for writing in with your answers. If you would like to participate in the future, you can go to facebook.com slash the level podcast and watch for the prompts to go up on. Uh, Monday afternoons. Thank you to OMG Amoose for uh, suggesting the prompt and thank you to Dennis for putting it up.
the end boss. Now it is time for the end boss, where we talk about things that are happening in the world of video games that are exciting to us for some reason. Um, I've got one <laughs> <laughs> for some reason. Wait, you just thought like, <laughs> yeah. that's so, so judgmental. I know. For I mean, for 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 you know any reason. I don't want to. I don't want to say it's a good reason. Maybe it's exciting <laughs> to you for a bad reason. I don't know. Um, this one might be exciting to me for a bad reason. Uh, so. Um, <laughs> So, you know, fan projects of Nintendo related things are common, but you never see them. Like basically they're they're reported on and then they're immediately squashed. That is probably going to happen to this if it has not already happened, but a uh, a, a fan developer has created a version of Super Mario 64 for Windows. It's not emulated, it just runs directly in DirectX 12. You just load it up and fire it up and you play a full version of Mario 64 um, at your computer, you know, whatever resolution you want. Uh, you're not, uh, you know, trying to fight with any kind of N64 emulation, which is really spotty. It is literally just Mario 64 on your PC. Uh, this is the result of a couple of different, uh, like date, basically data leaks and cracks that have come out specifically about the way that like the N64 natively interprets files and things like that. Um, I've looked around, uh, trying to find like a downloadable executable of this, uh, but I have not been able to basically any forum where people are discussing this has a rule against linking to or distributing pirated uh, pirated stuff which is what this absolutely is and i started digging deeper than i i dug to deeper places than i would feel safe downloading stuff yeah. from uh you know uh there and people were saying like oh yeah all you have to all you have to do is like download the source code from this git repository and then you know dump the assets from the rom and boom bada bing bada boom there you go and it's like i don't know how to do that can i get a dot xe file please preferably untainted by yeah. malware <laughs> uh <laughs> So I was hip to this. I saw um, Allison uh, posting about this and kind of giving it rave reviews for how usable it is and for kind of just how remarkable it is to play to play this game on your computer like that. Um, but, you know, now as you know, it's 1030 p.m. on the day that it is put out, I, I expect that nintendo's cease and desist order is going to drop so hard and so fast that the shock wave will <laughs> cause lights to flicker so who knows how long this is going to be a going concern especially considering uh the fact that nintendo is they haven't they, they have announced that they are bringing a switch port of mario 64 uh i think this year or next year so yeah, it was called Super Mario Odyssey. It's great, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, <laughs> um, but yeah, like it looks cool and the videos. I don't know. They give me a hankering to play some Mario sixty four. It's a fun ass game, at least the first half of it. <laughs> no, it's just it's it's more fun learning how to play it than actually doing like the challenges and stuff. Like the the whole game is fine, but like you know, it for me it wears out its welcome after you you know, get all the novelty of it. Yeah. At a certain point, it starts to feel a little sadistic towards you. Yes. But it's still a good and very important game overall. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's mine. Uh, let's see going on here. Uh, Dennis, what's going on with star Wars and VR? If you yeah. say may the fourth be with you, I will kick you off of the show. <laughs> you know i'm gonna go i'm just gonna go find a different story i've already i've already spent <laughs> enough goodwill here no uh, <laughs> so star wars vader immortal um the you know the vr experience which is it's weird they insist so much it's an experience not a game yeah it's like oh god that's usually like a hallmark of like oh this is gonna be bad uh, but no, it, it's, Vader Immortal is apparently pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, I have to say apparently because I own a PSVR and it did not come out there. Mm -hmm. It was um, a, I think it was an Oculus exclusive. It came it came with my uh, Oculus Quest. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you you might be able to speak to it better than I. Mm -hmm. um, it is coming to PSVR uh, later this summer, which is very exciting. Um, you know, like I said, it, it was 
well reviewed. It, it seems like something I'd want to try. Uh, the other interesting thing is that it's Ninja Theory uh, behind the game, Burr? which, uh, yeah, at least they've been partnering with Ninja Theory for the PSVR port. Okay. Um, which uh, that, I took that to mean that Ninja Theory also worked on the original game. Um, and if that's true, uh, that means there's hope that uh, the Hellbra- Hellblade VR game will come to PSVR eventually. Wasn't Ninja Theory acquired by Microsoft? Oh shit! Um, no, they're definitely they're definitely working alongside Ninja Theory. I think you are right in saying that that they huh. were acquired by Microsoft. Um, however, it's uh, it, you know the the article clearly states they're working alongside Ninja Theory. Nice. Um, hmm. What exactly that means, I don't know. I would love, love, love to get Senua's Sacrifice, uh, uh, the VR version on mm-hmm. uh, PSVR. Uh, that. They, they were pretty clear that that was never going to happen, one, because of the acquisition, two, because um, it is not exactly easy on the the specs and PSVR is among the weaker VR headsets. Mm-hmm. Um, so my guess, seeing that Vader is coming to PSVR, is that we will eventually get the VR Hellblade uh, for PS5. Okay, yeah, I could see that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, good games coming to more platforms is mm-hmm. always great, um, especially in the VR world, um, keeping yeah. it accessible as possible. Yeah, more stuff specifically coming to PSVR, which is the most accessible, you know, price wise, I think set up and hardware wise of any of these. That is always going to be good. You know, mm-hmm. I like I fired up, like I said, it came with my Oculus Quest. I did like uh, basically like it, like a half hour, hour of part one because it shipped in like three episodes or whatever. I didn't get to any like lightsaber stuff. It was mostly like moving around in starships and stuff like that, which is fun, you know, but uh, it wasn't enough to pick, have me pick it back up. The fact that Ninja Theory might be, might be associated with it makes me think that maybe the sword fighting might actually be badass. So hmm. I'm very curious to go back and see now. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, let's see, Ben, what's happening with Evo? I guess, yeah, or see, is Evo happening? Some kind of good news to like uh, cut against like how South by Southwest handled coronavirus stuff. Uh, Evo announced that they're not going to be having a convention this year. Uh, mm-hmm. Makes sense. Las Vegas is still shut down, from what I understand, at least casino wise. Yep. Um, uh, but the way they're handling it, they're refunding all the tickets for people who bought them. They're automatically refunding all the hotel rooms for people who bought hotel rooms for it. Um, and then they're going to move the event to online, but they haven't uh, talked about the details of how they're going to do that yet. Right. Um, so see, I see it as a positive news story where it's, they're still going to make Evo happening. They're handling it really well uh, for anybody who already bought into it. So way to go, Evo. Yeah. I mean, it's got to suck for them financially. I have no idea what their insurance situation is, but it's yeah. definitely the right thing to do. And if they screwed over people this year, maybe some of them would have understood. Uh, but that would definitely be a PR hit that would hurt them, you know, in years mm-hmm. coming. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's it, a lot of, you know, conferences and cons are going to some kind of digital version that feels decidedly less viable for a fighting game tournament than yeah. for others. Yeah. I kind of on a similar note, I watched a chess tournament over the weekend and that was the same sort of deal where everyone's just playing online now. Yeah. It's like a very different experience. Yeah. I just, I have no idea. I mean, like look at the difference between, you know, playing poker in person and online poker, you know, where mm-hmm. one has the element of like literally understanding the person's body language and the other is just about the odds. And I have no idea. I don't know enough to say which is more effective. The other is yeah, closed I, optional. Yeah. <laughs> I, I feel like that. There's a lot of in person poker that's closed optional, but we won't <laughs> yeah. go there. I mean, progressively close optional. <laughs> See, I I feel like that's sort of like the difference between, yo, know, drinking at a, a bar and drinking alone. Okay. Hmm. Wait, which one's better in this situation? <laughs> you know, it's it's up to you. I mean, right now <laughs> or in general? <laughs> Do I need to feel personally on blast for this whiskey or <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, whiskey. I mean, goo gone. <laughs> oh. oh, uh David, what is going on with uh Kojima? 
So this is straight up a uh, me stealing Cole's patented here's a thing that exists um, right. strategy. <laughs> but uh, the New York Times has a interesting kind of, um, I guess, profile on Kojima that uh, more or less revolves around like, why the heck do people like Kojima? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I don't know how to feel when, it's, when someone would approach me and be like, hey, we want to do a news story, a feature, ad, in fact, on why people actually like you. <laughs> yeah. So I joke about that. It's actually, I mean, it's actually, you know, very positive, very interesting, yeah. but it is to a significant degree kind of trying to explain like why he is, you know, I don't know, uh, a phenomena thing, whatever yeah. you want to say. I mean, the fact that this is a New York Times magazine, like they're trying, they're not trying to justify him to us. Like he doesn't necessarily have a, doesn't have anything to prove to people who know games, but like this seems to be explaining it to normies. Right, exactly. <laughs> I mean, non, non derogatorily, but just people who may not be aware that like video games, you know, have a history of auteurs, yes, but also here is one who is really active and their work is really pronounced, right? Yeah, and I feel like there's also kind of an interesting dynamic to it of, like, how how do you explain, like, even examples of the weird uh, weird stuff in, say, like, the Metal Gear Solid series mm -hmm. without any, any context? Yeah, it's mm -hmm. tough. Yeah. So, like, you know, they, they have a section where they're, you know, they briefly explain, like, the talk about, like, the Psycho Mantis fight. But it's like, that just sounds like nonsense if you're, you know, <laughs> yeah. not a gamer, like, even yeah. explained. If you're, if you're not aware that, like, switching the port that your controller is plugged into is just not a dumb thing, you know? Right. Yeah. Just to, like, so much of, I mean, specifically, like, Psycho Mantis, you know, is probably the most pronounced example of this sorry i'm using the word pronounced a lot but like oh like a lot of this is special because it upends assumptions how do you explain that to people who do not carry those assumptions right exactly it's yeah, it's hard to do on a generalized sense usually you can like if you're talking to an individual you can relate it to their thing or something yeah, in the world yeah. of their thing but yeah yeah cool. nice this is a nice long form article i'm going to put that yeah. over on my ipod or ipad and, and uh mess around Put it over to my iPod Nano. <laughs> Read it line by line. <laughs> also, David, the the original uh, link you you shared from just kind of a, a Hacker News board uh, that then linked to this. I was so sure you were giving us the uh, Mario uh, DirectX <laughs> yeah. game. Oh, that'd be cool. Oh yeah. no, sorry. <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> Hacker News is my my go to for just a little bit different uh, take on some of these things. So yeah. that's hmm. where I find most of these. Nice. Cool. Well, that sounds like a show to me. How do you all feel about bundling it up? Buttons. The credit. Thank you so much, everybody, for listening to this episode of The Level, level number 328. Um, that was my grandpa's birthday, March 28th. Happy birthday, mm -hmm. Grandpa. Rest in peace. Um, hopefully, hopefully nobody's voice did the lower thing. However, my backup recording is free of clicks. So if it got real bad, I can go and do some find and replace. That is fine. I'm, I'm hoping mine did. And I request that it not be taken out. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> I can pitch shift all of you. Just make you, make you, incom <laughs> make, make you incomprehensible. <laughs> I'll go tune the level. <laughs> yeah. Pixie. <laughs> um, but if you're listening, there are plenty of things you can do. Uh, the duck feed Patreon has a lot, um, you know, uh, just if you are looking for content, the $5 level, uh, has our, has a show that me and Gary do about, uh, Lovecraft film adaptations. We recently covered, uh, reanimator, which is an amazing movie, um, that I would recommend people watch a, but also B, uh, I think the episode about it was fun. Just a bunch of stuff there, uh, patreon.com slash duck TV. But for this show in particular, Ratings and reviews, uh, come join us in the Duckfeed Slack, um, uh, in the, uh, the channel there to talk about stuff and, you know, share games and experiences and stuff. And of course, look for the multiplayer prompts to go up on Facebook, facebook.com slash the level podcast. Um, is there anything I'm forgetting folks? Thank you. Good. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, I've been Cole Ross. You can see my tweets on Twitter at Cole Ross, K-O-L-E-R-O-S-S. -S. 
I've been Dennis Furia. You can find me uh, newly minted on Instagram mm. at Deck of Wonders. Um, and I've been putting up more and more art from the game there. So Neat. Um, for anyone that didn't uh, or doesn't remember from previous, I'm working on a card game uh, called Deck of Wonders. It's like a solitaire version of Hearthstone um, with some legacy mechanics thrown in for fun. And uh, yeah, I've been getting art in that is very exciting. So sharing yeah. that on Instagram at Deck of Wonders. Nice. I'm David Mysmith, and you can find me as long as you stay at least six feet away. <laughs> I mean, taken as red. <laughs> um, and Ben. I've been Ben Merkel at Merkel Be on Twitch. <laughs> I like it better if you tell us all to sign off individually. Oh, sorry, no. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to move things along. Um, and stick around for some titles. Greta, why are you on my desk? This is not the time. It, there, there is an appointed time. There's an appointed time in the afternoon for you to be on my desk. It's, Chaos. it's nice that you think that cats follow rules. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, cool. Who has titles? Got some titles here. Okay. All right. Um, one from very early on, Existential Overhead. Okay. Um, one from uh, probably not in the episode, but you are not a book. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, when it, when she was uh, on my bookshelf, Greta was Greta, going yeah. to be a strategy guide. Um, and then finally, katana controller. Okay, a nice little bounce to it. Yeah, katana controller. Um, who else has one? I have one. I have a relevant sentence. <laughs> Just uh, like the sound. <laughs> what was that from? Context was uh, talking about XCOM and talking about death sentence or an irrelevance. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, David, how about you? So I had a single one. Uh, it was one button colon kill. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I have one. This was a Dennis line. Uh, it's one word. Thingus. <laughs> uh, nothing got multiple votes. Yeah, it's a weird auteur week this week. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we we had two on the theme of the katana controller. Yes, one katana controller and one button kill. Yeah, one button kill. I like one button colon kill better than just katana controller. I think I'm down with that. Yeah, and how, how does everybody feel about that? One button I, kill. I have no strong opinions. Okay. Yeah, let's go with that. Sweet. All right. Cool. Well, I'm gonna go attend to my needy to my needy kitty cat. <laughs> yeah. All right, guys. See y'all. See huh? ya. Stay safe. Stay sane. Yeah. yeah. Take care. Likewise.